You're listening to the Big Three of B2B Leadership Podcast with Mike Faherty, where world-class business leaders share their secrets for personal, organizational, and market growth. Gain powerful insights from industry leaders that have been tested by the fire. Hi, my name is Mike Faherty, and I am your host. T- today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Gotti Pollock. Um, Gotti is a master chair with Vistage Worldwide, and uh, he's the founder of Heroes Leadership Journey. Uh, Gotti's been coaching CEOs and business leaders um, since 2007, and he's been teaching them his quiet, confident, humble leadership practices that he learned in the battlefields of the Middle East. And he has a fascinating story, and I'm so proud to introduce him to everyone listening today. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Gotti. I'm, I'm a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Mike. It's an honor. All right. Awesome. Well, look, um, before we get into the business stuff, and you have a tremendous amount of insight uh, into business, um, but you have a, a fascinating story. And so I thought we could take a couple minutes and just um, talk a little bit about um, the, your background and tell us a little bit about where you grew up and, and um, kind of, you know, uh, your, your life before business. Sure. So uh, I was born in Israel. I lived there for the first two years of my life, and I, uh, my family then moved back to Canada, where we lived in uh, Montreal and Toronto, and I was always fascinated uh, by leaders and history and strategy, and I was always reading about uh, World War I and World War II and the great leaders and what had made the difference, what had made the difference, and so I was always fascinated by that, and uh, when I was 18 in 1970, my family uh, moving back to Israel, uh, I enlisted in the army there, and I was serving in the military when the 1973 war broke out, which was a major two-front attack, and it was really a vicious, brutal war, and I was I was in the thick of it, and um, it was there that I, I really um, participated in a battle, which changed my entire view of leadership, in which I saw. Uh, my battalion commander calmed us down under artillery fire. He took a platoon of four tanks and destroyed an enemy battalion of 30. And then when all the other tanks were hit, he he rescued everybody. And then after he rescued everybody, he jumped into another tank to rescue a friend of mine bleeding from the head who was left for dead. And that just kind of blew in my mind. And I had to understand how one person, one person could be such a great leader and change so many lives and change the course of history and events and make such a difference. And so I, I, I read as much as I could. I studied it. I tried to be as excellent as I could in everything I did. And my idea of leadership was if you saw the big picture, like I thought Amnon, my mentor, who retired as a general, so he was a great leader and later consulted for the Israeli military. So, and, and he was really in civilian life, he was a bus driver. So he didn't do it on status or prestige or connections. He did it on pure leadership qualities. And I was driven to understand that. And I thought that what I saw was great strategy and excellent was what leadership was. And so as, as I went through life, I felt something was missing. I, I had to be closer to leaders. I had to work with them directly. And so I spent over 6,000 hours working with leaders, great leaders of great companies, and being up close and personal, listening, coaching, learning, mentoring, understanding of that. At the same time, I'm talking to Amno. And uh, in Israel, I go back and forth to Israel to get leadership tips from him. And, and I understand that I have this vague understanding that, um, that something about something related to him is what I'm doing today. And, and the rest is kind of a fog, but I, I stay connected to him and, and I come back and I teach my leaders and what I've learned from him. And I get a little confused talking to him because um, for two reasons. One is he doesn't talk about leadership per se. He's talking about me. He's talking about the things I had done where I demonstrated great leadership, things that I was doing my best to forget. And then he also brought up a lot of things that I'd consciously deleted from my mind, which led me to then um, like getting diagnosed and treated for combat related PTSD, like 35 years after the war, like I was living with it and didn't know it. And then I did a deep dive into trauma 
and healing, understanding the nervous system and that give me a huge insight into conflict resolution, how to work with leaders in, in crisis, how to resolve conflicts, how to solve crises and how to create strategies. So really my leadership coaching methodology evolved from the battle and my conversations with Amna. It was, I'm known as a go-to Vistage chair on dispute resolution. When there are problems within companies that nobody will touch with a 10 foot pole, mm -hmm. I'm the guy who dives right into it. And, and from there, we move into the crisis management, how you manage the crisis. And from there, we build on the strengths to um, really build the strategy and build a new and much larger company. And that was really the story of the battle. That's what happened in the battle. So it's a reenactment of the battle minus the trauma. Once I got the trauma part of it peeled away. And um, in, in doing that, I discovered that what made Amnon great was five core leadership qualities that he demonstrated. He was calm under fire, he had tremendous courage, he had excellence, he had empathy, and he had flexibility. And that's what allowed him to be the great leader. And what I recognized over time was that I was looking at myself as two out of the five qualities I had, uh, the strategy and the excellence. And these are all qualities that all of us, that the great leaders have had our entire lives. They are things that they are every single facet of our life, business, personal, professional, social, they show up in every area for as long as we can remember our earliest memories. They're usually telling us something but one of those core qualities. What I discovered was that like me, many of the leaders I was coaching, if you ask them, what made them successful? How do you build your company? They could tell you one or two qualities. They could tell you that great vision, or they were calm under pressure, or they had great vision. There, there's, I've documented over 150 different qualities that the various combinations of them make great leadership. They're all different for everybody. And many leaders, they were abandoning some of the qualities that made them great. And oftentimes they were doing that because there was some pain connected to it. And I would do for them what Adnan did for me, in a nutshell. I would help them, I would comment on and help them see the strengths that they were displaying and using in their business and leading people, but they couldn't see it. And in doing that, that's when they solved their toughest problems, that when they became really great leaders and really led great companies. And that's the most fulfilling part of my work. Yeah, so did, did your perception of leaders, has it changed from, well, let's, let's talk about the, the general for a moment. Um, you had your recollections of him on the battlefield as a leader and the leadership uh, that you saw him um, exhibit at that time. And then years later, you reconnected with him. Um, were the leadership qualities consistent over that time, or did you get any, is that when you started to see the full picture of leadership? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what a great question, because it goes to the heart of what great leadership is. And I think my insight compared to every other book on leadership that I've read, which is always about some variation of do this and this situation, and you will be a great leader. And the question is, like how in battle, do you do something that calls for great leadership if your nervous system is shot, if, you, if you're not able to do it, right? There's lots of advice about what to do. And we all in our best moments know exactly what to do. The question is how to do that in those decisive moments. And the answer to that really is that these five core qualities are innate in us. They describe who we are. And for exactly him, the same calm voice that everybody, everybody who served under him would say one thing. They would come back to him 40 years later and they'd say, I still remember the calm in your voice over the radio. It just calmed everything down. And he speaks the exact same way today, the way he speaks to his wife, his kids. It, 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 it's not a leadership pose. It is who he is. You know, it's fascinating. You've, you've shared a lot and you've been a really, um, really vocal and open about um, your journey recovering from, if that's the right way to put it, PTSD. Uh, I don't know, do, do you say that you're recovering or do you say that you're, you're dealing with or you're coping with? What, what, how do you phrase that? 
the way I think about it, that's why I call it the, heater, the, the hero's um, journey to great leadership. It's just part of the journey. It's part of something that was blocking me from, from really being the great leader that I was meant to be. And as I released it, I stepped into that leadership in a way that I hadn't before. I think a lot of people would be fascinated to know that you, that you, you uncovered this, this PTSD so many years after the battle, so many years after the trauma. And I think people think that, well, you know, I had trauma, but I don't have any, I don't have any post-traumatic stress from it. Right. right. And then, and then you, you sort of went through a process where you really uncovered it all um, and realized the impact it had been having on your life all along that you just were not aware of. It was just a constant, it was a constant factor that you weren't even calibrated for. Um, when you talk with leaders who, who are struggling, what are the things that you recognize or what are, what are some of the ways that you help them um, maybe come to terms with maybe there is trauma, uh, maybe there was trauma that they experienced that it is having an impact on them? I tell my story um, because those leaders, what I recognize is I, I work with high achievers. Um, and oftentimes, to a startling, to an amazing degree, the purpose of what drives those leaders to high achievement is a desire to mask an inner pain, an inner experience that they might have had and are trying to move beyond. At some point, all the high achievement in the world doesn't mask that inner experience. And when they are ready to confront that, they have had many people over their lives tell them that they should get help or they should get coaching or they should get therapy or they should do that. And they've blown all those people off because they're saying, look what I've achieved. Who's going to tell me that there's anything wrong with me? Because the high achievement kind of proves there's nothing wrong with me. So there's this internal struggle that's going in where some part of us knows there's something wrong with it. And we try to wipe it away or heal it or make it better or deny it. And denial is a valid coping strategy uh, for when something overwhelms our system, it helps us get through it. Um, the word I use is homeostasis. Like when we go to the doctor or we go to the hospital because we have a broken arm and the doctor sets our arm, what's actually healing our arm? It's not the doctor, it's not the hospital, it's not the antibiotic, it's our body. Our body itself strives for wholeness. It wants to be complete. It's innate for that. So that part of us, that even though on a conscious level, I could deny that anything happened to me in the war, therefore nothing could possibly be wrong with me. Everybody I knew did way more than I did. So what could be possibly wrong with me? Yet we're drawn to situations, circumstances, people, things, books, phrases, people that say things that have experiences that we're drawn to. That inner resonance, that's our homeostasis. And the single most important thing I learned was to listen to that. And that was like, I worked with a coach who had overcome the most unbelievable trauma that I had ever heard of. And I would say things like, oh, I didn't have trauma at all. But tell me more about how you got past it, right? And I see the same thing with people I work with, high achievers who will say, oh, I don't have anything like that, but I'm fascinated by your story, tell me more. That's homeostasis. That's us drawing to the things that we need to make us whole. Yeah, so do you think that in some way, people with trauma, um, the ones that can, is there a way to channel that trauma into productiveness and into achievement? And is do you think in some ways that's, that's some of those people, that's their, that's their sort of secret power that they've somehow, that, that, that trauma has somehow enabled them to focus or, or execute at a higher level than others at times? Yeah, so that is um, a false belief before the trauma is resolved. That's, that's a belief I had about combat. Like, oh, well, I knew I was different than other people, I could do more things, I could do different things, I could tolerate more, I could handle more, I could achieve more, because I have. 
And I call that the wound becomes the identity. And what that happened is, what's really happening is our, our nervous system, we're always in one of three states. We're, as humans, we're wired to connect. And the most powerful way, the way we will always try first is what you and I are doing, social engagement, we're talking. And when our nervous system is healthy and we can get the visual and vocal to cues that we're being heard and we're being understood and those needs are being met, our heart rate goes down uh, by about 20 to 30 beats a minute. That's called a vagal break. And what happens then is uh, our body calms down. It has more energy to restore itself. What happens the other, when that fails, then we go into fight or flight. And when we're in fight or flight, it could be a conversation, it could be physically. If the conversation becomes argumentative because you're not getting me, and then we escalate or a physical fight, doesn't matter. What happens in our nervous system is we get cortisol, neocortisol, which is adrenaline, which is tremendous boosts of energy to deal with a threat that happens beneath our level of awareness. So in the moment, we don't feel traumatized. We feel great because we're getting this adrenaline. What happens when the event is over is that there's a sense of collapse because I got this adrenaline spike and in order to restore myself, I need to go into social engagement. I need to connect. So my body has more resources to repay the adrenaline. I'm really borrowing energy from the future because my body says, if you don't deal with this threat, there is no future. So the body's all in to whatever it takes. And it, it just kind of simplifies and we lose contact with emotions. The only emotion that we don't lose contact with is anger because that can generate adrenaline. So it's useful when there's a threat and we kind of live in a simplified threat, but we're achieving more because we're constantly triggered. Wow. So how does, how does that trauma or PTSD hold people back? So how does it keep them from being their best? Sure. So, so what happens when we're stuck in that fight or flight? So, when we're healthy and, and we get into a fight with somebody, our nervous system can release it, release the trauma. We move into social engagement, we restore ourselves, and we can move smoothly all day long. The definition of PTSD or traumatized is we're chronically stuck in fight or flight. And so one of the symptoms is we don't connect well with people. We don't pick up on their visual, vocal cues. We don't know when they're getting us. We don't know when they're not getting us. We're working on adrenaline. We're just driving hard. So that damages the relationships. And what we'll often say, well, it doesn't matter, but I'm achieving. I have this physical sense that I'm very strong and powerful because I'm chronically stuck in, tr in triggering adrenaline and collapse and exhaustion. So when you, ha have you ever had coworkers or leaders tell you, I need you to talk to someone. I think there's something wrong. I, th I, think, there's a, I think there's a problem and I can't get through to them. All the time. <laughs> what does that sound like when the CEO, because the CEO probably doesn't have the language that you do to, to express, you know, what he or she may be thinking or seeing, right. you know, so what are some of the things that they do see that causes them to sort of seek your help? Sure. So oftentimes there's somebody significant in their organization, somebody that they need in the organization could be, could employ, um, it might be a partner or it might be somebody they report to, a CEO or a board. Um, and typically they will say things like the person is very talented, works extremely hard, um, but they're in their head a lot, right? They think a lot. They might have a blank effect to their face. Their face is kind of masked, really hard to read them. Um, their vocal tone might be monotone, right? And so, and, and they work really hard to achieve. And sometimes there's a lot of friction with them and other people and they don't get it. Those are classic signs of what I just talked about, of the social of the triggering of the adrenaline and the cortisol. So, so tell me a little bit about your, your new, I don't want to call it a new business, but this new focus that you've, that you've developed around this hero's leadership um, you know, a uh, journey. Um, and so you've, you've talked about these five core leadership 
um, principles. I, I'm not sure the language that you use, but call powers. powers. You call them powers. So tell me, what are, what are the five and, and how do we find ours? Ah, so this is really, um, they're different. And that's the question of questions. Like, how do we find ours? And the way I find, my, so I had two, right, that it, were like long. And, and for instance, study strategy, history books from earliest childhood and in earliest childhood, excellence, whatever I did, hawker, hockey, soccer, football, bass. My mother can tell you stories about, she would listen to me shoot the tennis ball against the basement wall for hours because I was practicing to get it like right between the goalie's leg and the goalpost. I, like I would practice, like I was willing to do that. That drive, that persistence, that for excellence, that was always something. And, and I do that to this day, whether it's hockey, basketball, tank gunnery, coaching, like 6,000 hours coaching, like I will do whatever it takes to get to that level of excellence. And that was kind of me working off a lot of adrenaline. And um, Unknown helped me see and would talk to me relentlessly about you were, emp you were empathetic. You saw and felt and heard other people's pain and you were able to lead them that way. And when I came back to Israel and I told him I was leading people, he said, you're empathic, lead people that way. And I rejected it because, hey, that's not a manly thing. And it took a friggin' general in the toughest battle I ever saw, talking to me for years, getting me past that denial of myself. And actually it was only when my members started telling me, actually, the thing I value most about you is, you can always tell me what the other guy is thinking. So it took me a long process because I buried it for a long time to accept that. I didn't see myself as courageous, but hell, I was pissed off I wasn't in the battle all the way through. That's because I was courageous and I was flexible. Like I was seeing myself as maybe I didn't belong in this crew or that crew. And I was in all sorts of different situations in the war. I could never settle myself down. I never really belonged every, anywhere. I kind of saw that as, as a weakness. I could never find my home, my job, just settle down with my own crew and, and, and do my thing and, and, and shoot the tank gun. That's all I wanted to do. But I didn't get to do that all the time. And I was kind of disappointed in myself. And he said, he kept telling me, no, you're flexible. You, you were good in a tank. You were good in a half track. You were good in the Jeep. You were good in any circumstance. You were good with other, right? To see that as a power took, took many years. And then I look at my life history and I did many different businesses because I was curious about life. I wanted to see banking. I wanted to see insurance. I want to see also, I want to see retail. I didn't want to see it and look at it and read about it. I want to experience it. And it took years for me to really accept that. And then start to see the same pattern with others. And I would do the same thing. I'd be relentless about, you no, know, you're really good at interviewing people. Like you're the best guy about hiring salespeople, right? You really have this figured out. Nobody else, none of the other clients I work with do that. Same thing Anna was telling me. No, you did this. Nobody else did that. They did the opposite. That's who you are. That's what makes you unique to you. So how do we find those things without our own Adnan? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I got to get one of those guys and I don't have one. Well, Mike, as you've taught me, you don't get anywhere without a guide. <laughs> I, I, I stayed stuck. You know, in my head, in my thinking, in my own abilities, in my own independence, in my own autonomy, in my own wanting to do things my way, till I found a guy who could reflect whether it was Amnon or was my coach, who could reflect back to me and say, you really get energized, you're really effective, you're really powerful naturally in this situation. And really, it goes back to an early childhood thing. That's how children develop when a parent delights in, oh, you're great at writing or you're great at music or you're great at, at, at talking to your friends or quizzes or science. And that is true. That resonates for the child and it comes alive and the child believes in themselves and they live it fully. That's how I'm grew up. That's how he was naturally in the battle because he was always seen for who he was. And that, as I discovered, is uncommon, actually. And the work we do as a coach, as I do, is to help work with those people and help them identify. And you can start to think about it. What are the times when you've been the happiest and the most successful and where you made the most positive impact on people? Like when everything was working, 
when you were happy, when you were effective, and you had external validation that you had, like I needed from my clients to say, no, I really value that specific, your ability to feel what other people are feeling and put it into words and develop a negotiating strategy. You know, it, it's, it's fascinating that, I mean, this, this general character is such a, um, you know, he's like a guardian angel almost that, that he, he can really, it, it's fascinating that 40 years later, I think you said four, yeah, 40 years later, that he can, you made such an impact on him. It says a lot about you, but also says a lot about him that he can remember the things that made you special and be able to, to share that back with you and pr provide that insight to you so many years later after that situation, uh, after that incredibly brutal battle that you were part of. Um, says a lot about, says a lot about him, but it also says a lot about, um, you know, about you and the situation that you were in. Um, you know, not all of us have, not all of us um, have the benefit of someone witnessing our trauma, right? And, and, and are there to sort of, and have the insight that maybe he had to, to pull out, well, no, that wasn't, that wasn't, you know, um, a lack of connecting, that was flexibility, that was actually a strength, that wasn't a weakness, um, that, you know, yes, you were, you were hurt and, and, and scared you thought, but what that really was, was you were courageous and you were empathetic um, to the plight of, you know, your, your brothers. Not everyone has that, right? And so I guess the, the challenge is, and I think the journey that you're on and, the, and what you're trying to do is to help give people a process to uncover those things about themselves uh, when, when there's no one around to watch them uh, and no one to give them the insight from an external perspective, right? That they have to find those strengths inside themselves somehow. Um, and so you've got some exercises that it sounds like you, you take people through and questions, a series of questions that you ask people, you talked about, you know, when were you achieving your most and when were you happiest? Uh, when did you get the most external positive input from others? So you've got a series of questions that you might ask people, um, well, what's the, what's the big picture for, for the hero's leadership journey? What, what do you hope to accomplish with this, this effort over the next few years? Well, thank you, Mike, because that is what you said earlier. Not all of us have an omni. And I have to tell you, like the gratitude and love that I feel for that man, he talked to me for 13 years. And he kept me back in, coming back to him. And he would say, I'm old. Don't leave me alone. Don't abandon me. Keep talking to me. When it was really, he was coaching me, right? He was keeping me talking back to him. And when I called him up and I related how things had settled out personally and professionally, he said, fine, you're on your way. Click. Mission completed. Like he felt that sense of responsibility for what we had done together over 40 years ago, that he talked to me for 13 years, brought me into his home, met his wife, talked about his kids. We spent hours hours and hours and hours talking together. And that's what made the difference. I was like my homeostasis said somehow I have to talk to this man. And literally when I called him up the first time after those 35 or 40 years, my voice was shaking. That man was like God. I was a private, he was a Lieutenant Colonel, retired as a general. It was like talking to God himself. Like my homeostasis had to drive me past that. There's something about this man and, and his commitment. And that's the same commitment I have to the leadership journey for all those leaders who don't have that unknown, for me to use my gift of empathy to be there. Uh, it's fascinating. I, I love that. I love the idea that he's asking you to talk to him because he's making you think he, you, he needs you. And what he was really doing was he knew that you needed him. And, but that, but if, he, if he said that to you, you would have rejected it and he knew that. It's fascinating. Just fascinating. Well, Gotti, it's a it's an incredible story. Uh, you've got incredible uh, insight. Uh, empathy is a word that I use a lot whenever I describe you to others, and that your ability to really hear people, um, and not just what they're saying, but really how they're feeling, and and really look at things through their eyes. And it's a it's an incredible gift that you have. And I'm excited about the work that you're doing to help people. 
um, who've experienced trauma, whether on the battlefield or in other areas of their life, um, uh, figure out a way through that to use that experience and to help them grow through that into their best version of themselves. It's, it's incredible work. Um, how can people get a hold of you? How can people find you if they want to continue the conversation with you? Sure. Uh, so the easiest way right now, uh, my, my email, gadi, G-A-D-I dot P-O-L-L-A-C-K at vistage.com, V-I-S-T-A-G-E dot com. And then uh, my website, I'm planning on rolling it out within 60 days, gadi okay. dot com. So it's been a rolling 60 days, but G-A-D-I P-O-L-L-A-C-K dot com. And uh, just, I think one thing I want to end on yeah. perhaps is that Please. what I really discovered was that trauma is way more prevalent than we ever thought. There is an adverse childhood experience study, the ACE study of over 17,000 adults who were age 58. And over 28% of them had experienced some sort of adverse childhood experience. That's abandonment, neglect, or abuse that affected them throughout the course of their life, mentally, physically, or spiritually in some way. So I discovered, you know, I thought I was alone with this. There's really a lot of it. It's more prevalent and it influences our life more than we think. And it's really found in our body. And the biggest mistake we tend to think, people tend to say it's in your head, get over it. It's not in our heads, it's in our body, it's in our nervous system. It can be released and I'm delighted to help. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Gotti. I appreciate you and for joining us and sharing your story with us. Um, and uh, we will include your contact information in the show notes that will be found on our website. Um, and please, uh, please, folks, if you've, uh, if you've been touched by what Gotti has shared today, uh, you know someone you think uh, could use uh, his insight or you yourself think that you just want to continue to talk with him. Um, that you don't have any problems, but you're just interested in hearing more, um, please reach out to Gotti. Um, he's an incredible resource. Thanks so much, Gotti. Look, uh, I appreciate, every, appreciate everyone joining us today and for the big three of B2B leadership. Thanks and have a great day. Thanks, Mike. Been an honor. Pro Sales Connection is a sales and marketing firm that has been helping B2B companies grow faster since 2009. Learn more about our proprietary fastest path to revenue process for B2B companies. Experiencing the possibilities begins with a short 15-minute call. Schedule yours at www.prosalesconnection.com and click Get Started.